What's up everybody, it's Charles. Today, taking your questions on oil pressure lights after an oil change, starting a new career, Mark 7 issues and more. This is episode 257 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. All right, if you want to get a question on a show like this, email me, charles at humblemechanic.com. Put question for Charles in that subject line. Ask your question right at the top. Hit the enter button a couple times, then give me the details of your question. And if you prefer, there are audio-only versions of this show, as well as many others, available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google, or of course, over at HumbleMechanic.com. All right, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals in a ton of OE maintenance and repair parts, timing belt kits, suspension components, and even fluids. In fact, they make the factory DSG fluid for Volkswagen and Audi. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. And finally, if you want a bunch of crazy good discounts to places like Black Forest, Eastwood, MT Knives, Sonic Tools, Kerma TDI, Scanner Danner, and a whole bunch more, check out that crew membership program. As always, links to that and everything else we'll talk about today down in the description. With that all wrapped up, let's get to your questions. First one up is from Matt. Charles, love your videos and your outlook on the industry. I've been doing auto maintenance and repair since before I had my license with my dad. He used to drag me out of bed on the weekends to help him do brakes, oil changes, and anything else the family car needs. It took me a few years to really appreciate what he was doing for me. Guys, that is so valuable right there. Dad or mom, taking kid, grandpa, uncle, whoever, aunt, taking kid and teaching them these skills. This is so vital. Really, guys, try and focus on sharing your knowledge as best you can with the younger generation. Just a little side note there, back to Matt's question. I've been working in the restaurant industry most of my working career, and I'm currently a general manager. I've come to resent the industry in the past couple of years, have taken its toll on me and my sanity. I heard that. My question is, I'm 31 years old with no professional automotive experience. Is it crazy to consider getting into the automotive industry by going to school and getting certified? What challenges would I face starting in the industry? Is my age negatively going to impact my job opportunities? Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Let's talk about a couple of things from Matt here. First of all, is he too old to change careers? No, you're 30. You've only been working 12, right? 12, maybe 14 of your working years. You're still very young in your career. Don't let your age scare you off from changing industry. Sure, you're probably gonna take a pay cut. So what? If you're way happier and you can still pay your bills and do the things you need to do, go for it. I think you would be much happier making less money doing something you love than schlepping around making a little bit more, but probably not all that much, doing something that you hate. And I don't care what that is. If that means you wanna get out of the car industry and go open a flower store, do that. I think that's awesome. This is all on you guys, right? Follow that thing that you really love to do. Are you gonna have problems with the interview process and getting the job? Honestly, I don't think so. The issue you're gonna have is that you're an inexperienced technician. Even if you go to tech school, you're still a rookie. You're still green as can be. So that's gonna probably be more of an issue than, than you being what's gonna be quite a bit older, probably about you know 10 years, eight years older than most everyone else, let's say, in, in going to tech school. But look at the positives. You have management experience, you have leadership skills, you've worked other jobs, you're not 19 and gonna stay out partying until you know, 2 a.m., at least hopefully not anyway, but I'm not judging, but you're probably gonna be less likely to do all those really dumb things that all of us did when we were 20 years old. And those things really can impact your job. So being 31, I think is something an employer is gonna be pretty favorable on rather than seeing that as a negative. If I were interviewing you, I would see that as a positive. Now, should you go to tech school or shouldn't you? This one really depends, man. Um, that's always a question that we have to answer for ourselves. What I would consider first, before you spend 50 grand on tech school or you know less if you're going to community college or whatever the cost is before we spend all that money plus tools plus all the rest of it maybe we should consider getting a job in the automotive industry first this doesn't mean you have to go be a lube tech for eight dollars an hour what about something else what about something like a service advisor maybe that's a pathway i've known several service advisors that hung up that pen and paper and went back into work in the shop. So that might be an option. The thing I want people to really do before they crack a whole ton of money and you know 30 years of student loans is to try the industry out. You're gonna probably find that there's a lot of parallels between the restaurant industry and the automotive industry. And that may be great for you because it's a familiar space and it may be terrible for you because well, you were burned out on that industry 
moving to a parallel one may not be the best thing for you. I've shot a couple other videos really speaking to that new technician. I'll try and actually make a playlist and put the link to the playlist down below. Go through those and, and you could kind of start to get a better vibe of what I think you're going to experience as a new technician, regardless of your age, whether you go to tech school or not, doesn't matter. I think these are always going to be new technician concerns. Man, if this is what you want to do, don't let anybody else talk you out of it. Look at the pros, look at the cons, and if this is where your heart is and you have to do it, forget everything else and go try it out. And if you hate it, well, then you hate it and you can go back to restaurant industry or go do something else. Maybe it's a pathway to opening up your own detailing company. I really don't know, right? We're all different. So I would, I, if it were me, I would dip my toe into that industry first and see if that's something I would even want to consider before, again, spending a bunch of money on tech school, time on tech school, buying tools, all to find out you hate the industry too. There's a lot of people that really hate the industry, a lot of people, and those are always the most vocal ones. So, dude, listen to your gut. You know what's right for you. You know what's right for your family, and do what's right for you. All right, next one up is from Chris on a 2010 Jetta oil question. Having an oil pressure light, I suspect not just a coincidence that I just changed my oil. I'd really love a minute of your time to help me figure out where my oil pressure is going. Thanks, Chris. Chris, you didn't tell me which engine is, so I'm gonna give you two different things for two different engines. This first thing is gonna apply no matter which engine. We need to go back, whether we did this oil change, whether we had it done professionally, we need to make sure we use the right oil, a good quality oil filter, and oil level is set correctly. Those are all three things that we wanna make sure we know. If you took it somewhere and had the oil change, I'd want a copy of that receipt to make sure that they use the right oil. Same thing if you wanna go back and look at the bottles you used if you did it yourself. Now, if you had a 2.5 liter, five cylinder engine, these actually had some kind of random thing going on where after an oil change sometimes, the light would come on and it was actually the oil pressure solenoid having issues. The TSB, I, th I think there was a TSB, it told you to change the oil and clear the faults and drive it for a certain period of time and see if it came back. So that may be something starting to fail on your car. I've had to replace those a handful of times. I even had one where a customer had their oil changed at a quickie change place. And I'm convinced they actually started the car with no oil in it. And that destroyed, it didn't like catastrophically destroy, but it sort of messed up all that top end stuff because it was starved for oil pressure. If you have a two liter turbo, the most common thing is a little sleeve inside the oil filter housing. When you twist that oil filter up and out, there's a little sleeve that sometimes will pop out. Like you'll walk away and of course it'll pop out when you're not standing there. And that can cause intermittent oil pressure issues as well. We also want to make sure that we don't actually have an oil pressure problem. Really, the best way to do that is to get an oil pressure gauge and install it where one of the oil pressure switches are. If this is a two liter turbo, super easy, they're right there. So 2.5, it's a little bit more challenging. Whenever it comes to oil pressure, we really wanna know, is this the car seeing an erroneous signal from a bad pressure switch, bad wiring, or a bad display component, or do we really have low oil pressure? Because if we really have low oil pressure, that is a we need to fix this immediately type thing. We can't put that off at all. So go back and look at your receipt, make sure you use the right oil, make sure the oil level is correct, and then you're gonna have to go from there. This may mean, this very well may mean taking it into a shop or buying an oil pressure gauge and hooking it up and actually monitoring the oil pressure that the vehicle has, that the engine has, rather than just the feedback display of a little light. One final thing, there's also a connector junction right behind the driver's side headlight. I've seen wires break there too, causing oil pressure light. It's probably the least common oil pressure light reason, but uh, something else you may wanna check too. All right, next one up is from Patrick. I can't seem to locate the third bolt to remove the driver's side strut on my 08 Torag V6. Do I have to remove the brake fluid reservoir and or brake master cylinder to access the bolt? Or are those wires in the way? Just don't wanna start taking stuff off for no apparent reason. Got the passenger side off, no problem, but having a bit of trouble with the driver's side. Thanks, Patrick. Okay, Patrick, on the 08, it looks like there's actually four bolts that come up like next to where the strut shock absorber spring assembly is. So if you go under the car, look up where the strut is, you'll see the upper control arm come in and there should be four nuts, bolts, holding um, the strut to that plate. If you wanna remove that plate that has the upper control arm on it, that's cool too, but you will have to take the ECMs and the cowl trim out 
in order to access those. It's been a long time since I've had the front suspension of a Torag, especially the older ones like that apart. So I'm like struggling really hard to remember exactly where that bolt is, but it is under one of the ECMs or that fuse panel. But look and see if yours has those four nuts that hold the strut assembly to that upper control arm plate. Because if you do, you can just take those out and get the strut unit out that way. I went out and looked at mine because uh, we have a 2015 and it's a little bit different than yours is. It doesn't have that same setup. So unfortunately, I can't just show you a picture right there. But it looks like that third bolt is underneath one of the ECMs or underneath the fuse panel right under where the caltrum is. So you'll have to pop that caltrum up. I don't think you have to take it off. I think you can actually just pop it up or some of them had that cutout. You can try lifting that cutout look under there because that may get you exactly where you need to go. Don't forget a lot of those suspension bolts are one-time use torque to yield bolts and of course if you take that off it's going to be recommended that you get an alignment which is not a bad idea to do on a Torag anyway. They usually require some adjustment. So man I hope that helps. That's a pretty easy one so let's move on to the next one. All right last one of the day I've gotten a bunch of times from a bunch of you guys so I'm going to just try and bullet point all of the issues on the Mark 7 that are really, really common. There are other issues going on with this car. Most of these are very low case numbers. So this is the most common things that at least I've seen and VW dealers are seeing on the Mark 7 right now. Now, when we talk about the Mark 7, for me anyway, I'm pretty much talking about the Golf, the GTI, and a little bit on the Alltrack. Of course, Audi A3 is on the platform. I think the TT is on the platform. A lot of other cars share many components with these Mark 7 cars too. So there may be overlap here a little bit on some other cars that we're not gonna talk about today. First and foremost, this one applies to Golf and GTI. That is the sunroof leaking. Now you might be like, Charles, we know it's a Volkswagen, the sunroofs leak, that's what they do. You're not wrong, um, but the Mark 7s actually seem to be the worst I've ever seen out of any car. And it's not just sunroof drains clogging because that was really one of the more common things going back to Mark IV B5 generation. On the Mark 7, it's actually the sunroof assembly, the sunroof cassette, that's cracking. These sunroofs are glued to the roof of the car and end up being basically structural on the vehicle. They're also plastic or composite technically. So what happens when the car does hard corners and shifts around, that tweaks and can actually crack. There's been multiple TSBs and multiple repairs on these sunroof cassettes. The body shop that we worked with had put multiple sunroof cassettes in many, many Mark 7s, which it's kind of a suck job because you have to glue it down to the roof, in addition to dropping the headliner and pulling all that stuff off. This doesn't so much apply to the Alltrack because the Alltracks have the panoramic roof. Those also leak too, but that's more from clogged sunroof drains rather than the actual sunroof cassette being a problem. Next up is wheel bearings. This has kind of been a trend a lot on VWs over the past like 10 years or so, and that's failing wheel bearings. I've seen them fail making noise. That's the most common one. And I've seen them cause ABS issues. Usually you get a fault code for the wheel that's having the issue. You spin it and it doesn't pick up the signal and you're, you've tested the wires from the sensor at that wheel all the way up to the ABS module, and those are good. It's typically just the wheel bearings. Luckily, these are super easy to install. It's like six bolts or so total, and uh, you can have it in and out in pretty quick time. I think warranty labor time is only like 1.1 or 0.9 or something like that, so it's pretty low, less than an hour warranty time. So if you're doing it yourself, you know, leave two hours just in case. There are triple square bolts that hold that wheel bearing in place, um, they're very shallow, so make sure you use a good quality tool on those. Next up is turbo failures. Now, this isn't like every one of them is going to have a turbo failure, but this is actually somewhat of a common thing that I've seen. CCTA, CBFA's had the issues too. Um, these turbochargers are also, I've seen a handful failing, causing weird problems like the car not starting. Of course, in addition to noise and low boost and things like that. If you have a Mark 7 and you're like, oh my god, my turbo's going to go out. Don't worry, it's not that kind of problem. So if you drive a Mark 7 and you're just like, oh my God, my turbo is going to explode, calm down. Don't worry, it's not that big of an issue, but it is something that we want to make sure we're paying close attention to our vehicle on. Next up is gear shifter failure. This is another Golf GTI issue. And what's happening is you're getting a fault code for the shift selector. Um, I've, put, I've put in five or six different shift selectors, I think, in, in cars when those first came out back in 2014. 2015. We actually did engines and transmissions on those two when they first came out. They've been way better since. Um, also, there's wiring issues at that connector that plugs into the shift selector. I've had a couple that had to be repinned. Ultimately, though, 
it's a failure of something inside the shift mechanism that uh, requires you to replace that whole unit, which means exhaust comes down, heat shield comes down. Not the most fun job, but if the car's relatively new, it's not all that bad either. Now, even though the CCTA CBFA were the main culprits of timing chain issues, the Mark 7s also have timing chain issues as well. Not at the scale that the CCTAs did, but it's a lot of chain wear, which is causing them to stretch or elongate if you prefer. Um, tensioner failures, cam adjuster failures, that kind of stuff. I've seen a little bit of all that. Broken valve springs, door latches failing, some of the more common things. Door latches, I feel like every generation of Volkswagen has those kind of issues. All in all, though, I actually think it's a pretty decent car, and there's been more than one occasion where I thought adding an all-track to the fleet would be a really good choice. So don't let that scare you off from buying one. Just that's kind of the most common things. I'm sure there's other things. If you guys know of any other truly common Mark 7 issues, drop it down in the comments. If it's just one dude on Vortex that had the problem and then one other dude did as well, I don't consider that common. I consider that to be sort of an anomaly and to have two cars with the same failure is not that weird to me. When we're talking hundreds of cars, that's when I start to get concerned. Also, coolant leaks from the water pump because and oil leaks from the Cambridge because those are issues that we never addressed and fixed from the CCTA engines, but they do happen, again, just not as common as the CCTA has. Now in three years, we may be having a different conversation about that, but as of right now, that's sort of where it's at. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. If you haven't heard, my voice sounds terrible, even worse than normal. Thank you, pollen season. I've been sick all weekend. So I'm gonna wrap it up. Questions, comments, you guys know what to do. Thank you so much for watching or listening, and I'll talk to you again next time.